reminds me sometimes that I still need to work uh, uh, a bit uh, and keep the pace with science. So I just realized is that uh, why that always happened to me. So if you always look into uh, last five talks which I have given in any uh, workshop or so something, they are always post lunch. And there is another common, uh, there is another common person in that is happened to Dr. Shweta. So now I understand is maybe the <coughs> after lunch you feel sleepy, right? So then they give the task to me so that I am blamed uh, that I come between your nice sleep after lunch and uh, uh, then a good lunch. So I I apologize in advance that if I uh, if I succeed to keep you awake, but if not, then anyway it's your benefit, right? You know so. Uh, I beg your pardon for that. <clears throat> so what I did is that I uh, it was a, it was a good thing because when I looked into the previous talks like what the, um, Dr. Baik talked yesterday and then uh, what <coughs> Professor uh, Panditurai and then uh, uh, Vijay also talked. So majority of the things which I initially wanted to uh, talk about uh, those are covered. So what I then thought that probably <coughs> it's a good opportunity for me to give a recap of how my group has evolved, right? You know, so that's the reason I picked up the uh, title as it is um, uh, of the workshop which we have given. And the reason I'm going to go through some journey about like, you know, how did we evolve. And then uh, majority of the focus I'll also try to give you on Muna. Uh, <clears throat> you see this figure here where it's a typical aerosol number size distribution where diameter which is plotted on the log scale and then you have the normalized concentration in centimeter cube on your y-axis. Any idea where this uh, graph could be? <coughs> Anybody uh, looking at the number concentration or looking at the size distribution, uh, can anybody try to tell where does it come from? <coughs> Any guess that where these measurements were carried out? Yeah. <laughs> right, you know, that is carried on at Navala Buller, obvious. And then, as I will go through the presentation, you would uh, probably acknowledge and appreciate this fact that this number which is written in the uh, in the set of the figure, that which is 467 centimeter particles per, meter, per centimeter cube, why it is important. <clears throat> I will try to follow more or less this uh, outline of the talk. I would briefly talk about the introduction and motivation that the aerosol source characteristics and processes, uh, aerosol new particle formation and growth which Vijay has roughly uh, talked about it in much more details actually and uh, new particle formation is going to be the very uh, <clears throat> important topic in coming years because it has now the direct relevance with the cloud formation and this is where we do not really understand how do they, uh, the new particle formation perturb or alter the cloud properties which of course has uh, further implications. So that's one thing. And then I would talk about the fundamental enhancement in aerosol uh, properties, which is chemical, uh, physical, chemical, and biological. <clears throat> I have a surprise there that there are certain properties which we tried to look into our group, which was very complex, and I don't know whether they are physical, chemical, or biological. And I will just leave those slides and uh, uh, <clears throat> two students, those who brought the complications, they are here so you can talk after uh, my talk to them who made it complicated. I'll talk a little bit about the aerosol modeling, uh, the limitations, what are the limitations uh, uh, about it and what are the challenges we have. And then basically way forward, uh, the, I'll not go into the details of that because uh, I think I will not have enough time. <clears throat> but I would rather dwell on this last point uh, which is I think as a young generation it is important for you to say that uh, my data is always our data, right, you know, our means our. So uh, I'll try to dwell a little bit upon why it is important that you should be very open to the collaborations, why it is <coughs> critical in that sense, and then your data is never your data, right? It is. I mean, I can't say that it is my data. It is always our data, right? You know. So I'll go with uh, that. So let's start with this. Um, any of these slides would have not been possible without the people on this picture. So my great gratitude and acknowledgement. Uh, to all my former students, current students, and then the collaborators, because I I, I, I collaborate left right center, and there is <clears throat> one benefit, of course, that you are under the climate science is one of the areas where you must collaborate because it is really multidisciplinary. Uh, it has an advantage that it expedites your work, meaning something which you are going to finish in six months, you may finish it in two months, 
And then the other advantage is um, you get a comprehensiveness to your study, right? But my philosophy is different that my idea is always good to delegate your idea to others so that they keep working, right? You know, and you can have fun. So <clears throat> not possible without um, these aerosol group members at the Center for Atmospheric and Climate Sciences and then the collaborators uh, which are listed here. Um, some of them are with me uh, for last uh, 20 years now almost, or at least 18 years. Some of them for last 16 years and then it's, it's all uh, dedicated to them. I also <clears throat> want to kind of summarize what Dr. Baig said yesterday that I uh, dedicate this slide to Professor Paul Purson where I had this opportunity to be associated with him, not professionally though, but had few lunches with him and then try to understand the life philosophy from him. Um, what he basically <clears throat> he tried to tell is that he introduced this term called Anthropocene and what it basically means is that just a summary of this particular slide is that we are now living in an uh, epoch, like you know you have different epoch which we have studied during the school, that we are now living in an epoch where the, the activities or the processes which are happening on the earth's surface are no more natural, but we as the humans are driving it, right? And, and let me tell you that it has a really bad implication. Look at the methane increase, it is exponential CO2, and then of course, um, Constantly increasing anthropogenic air pollution, this affects the planet, right, you know, and then it has a larger implication. And then we are more worried about the aerosol concentration, so on and so forth. So all credit to Paul uh, to introduce this new term called an Anthropocene, which means the new epoch about it. Well, everybody is an aerosol expert here, but I thought it doesn't hurt to talk about it for the orientation purpose at least that why the aerosol studies are more difficult as compared to the gas studies because with the gas like you know everything is less than one nanometer but the aerosol study the problem is like you have nine order of magnitude size range which you have to deal with and that brings in the more complications that you cannot really have one single technique to measure the entire size range just like the particle concentration and size you just can't do with that simple technique. I mean, Vijay would probably tell you better that how difficult it is to measure the particle concentration, just less than 3 nanometer, right? So that that poses the challenge and then maybe talk to Emil after the talk and she would try to uh, tell you that what difficulty is there when it comes to the bioaerosol and then maybe try to talk to Ashwati and Emil both because this particular figure here is right from Ashwati's paper which were observed in Munar, right Ashwati, if I am not wrong, right? So this is, we believe that it's a grass pollen which causes you an allergy. So if you want to talk more about these pictures here, please try to talk to Ashwati and uh, Emil after that. So what happens is that of course aerosols, they do have the primary sources and they can also be secondarily formed. Once they are in the atmosphere, they undergo the transformation and aging. And then we do uh, see that like, you know, uh, Professor Paniturai nicely explained that why these aerosols are important for the cloud formation, meaning that the clouds cannot be formed without the aerosols. The one those who do not form the aerosols can still have the ultrasound in their properties and then they are removed either by wet or dry deposition. This is how the cycle of the aerosol really goes on. And then obviously, therefore, they have an implication and effect on your atmosphere and climate. And then, of course, the biosphere and health. Although I'm not going to touch the biosphere and health uh, implication in this moment, but I would be very happy to talk to you uh, after the talk about it. <clears throat> uh, this is a very typical figure which everybody knows. Anybody in this room who has never seen this panel? Okay, glad. Okay. So what it shows is from the IPCC as usual that these are the constituents which are tending to warm the earth's surface and then this is the blue one are the one which are kind of tending to walk to, to cool the earth's surface. But what what striking feature here is that if you look into these error bars associated with those red constituents, those error bars are very small. But the moment it comes to the aerosol cloud interaction, which now community agrees it cools the earth's surface, those error bars are very big. I mean, they are even as big, I mean, probably twice the estimate itself. So what it means is that aerosol <coughs> cloud interaction represents the largest uncertainty in current and future understanding of the climate change. This, this net radiative forcing, this big error bar is basically coming in from this. So how do then we <coughs> solve this problem? Well, I mean, there is a big complication in that. 
And this particular flowchart would explain you that how this problem can be solved and then why you really need a multidisciplinary approach for it. Like me or my group or Vijay or Professor Panditurai or Jay Kumar or Gufran Bey cannot solve this problem. And why that doesn't happen? Because we need to have a good laboratory experiment, field measurement campaign and representative laboratory experiments which you can then particularly with the Indian context you need to have the field measurements which is in the contrasting environment and distinct season over India and then including the long and short term measurements. We saw in um, uh, Dr. Panditurai's talk that like you know why that long term uh, measurements were important. Then all these components you can put into the cloud property and process models and aerosol property and process models which then can be upscaled into the regional atmospheric models like you know India specific parameters and scheme. This is what he said that most of the schemes are developed for the mid latitude and we always need to fine tune it. So where does this come from? This is where it will come. Then you put that into the global atmospheric climate model and then eventually it can be uh, upscaled to the global climate modeling so that your final uncertainty in the future understanding of the climate change will uh, eventually reduce. That's what I say, like you know the predicted temperature range has been, this is what I think uh, that you saw in that video for the last 40 years we are still talking uh, of the range of 1.5 to 4.5 degrees centigrade which is too large. What do we do in our <coughs> group is that we look into the aerosol chemistry and physics, the cloud condensation nuclei, bioaerosol, climate modeling, a bit of climate modeling we do. And then our scientific approach is combining the laboratory field and model studies using advanced physical, chemical and biological technique. And as complicated as this collage looks to you, obviously I think Aishwarya was trying to pretend at least how complicated fitting that inlet is, which is right there in Nava lab, right, you know. So I don't know if it was uh, some sort of a combination that what she wanted to pretend or Kavya wanted to picture. But yes, fixing that inlet was very difficult. All right, let's look into the uh, fundamental uh, announcement in the aerosol properties, right? You know, I have always been a big fan of the aerosol size distribution, right? And I always think that if you are looking into the, under uh, if you are trying to understand the implication of aerosols on the climate, not on the health, then the aerosol size distribution is a very basic property. And believe me, uh, my student would always confirm you that I still get, I get very fascinated by the uh, aerosol size distribution plot, right? You know, a simple size distribution or a 3D figure. Now what I'm going to tell you in the next few slides is that we did this aerosol size distribution measurements. Um, when I came to India, I said that like, I tried to find it out if there are any systematic aerosol size distribution measurements or not. And then I find that at least under the contrasting location at the same seasons, uh, those were not there, right? And this whole journey, uh, I mean, they say that, uh, like, you know, the, 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 it's a small world, I always say that it's a small and round world, right? Now this particular figure, right, you know, this, this very journey started at this very place in 2013, particularly during the 2013 monsoon, right, you know, so just 10 year old figure, and then I still get fascinated because of it. Now look at these numbers here, right, you know, uh, so this is basically the three months of measurement which Shika, my first PhD student, she did. And then as you could really see that this is right from <coughs> May 10th to July 18th and these are the different percentiles of the size distribution. This is May, of course you have slightly high particle concentration, around 1200 or so something, even, uh, I, I, I don't know how, how much it is, like around 2000 particles per cc. And as the monsoon progress, that one thing which you see, not only that the number is changing, but your size has obviously shifted, like you know it's almost becoming the bimodal distribution instead of the monomodal distribution. Now what it does is that it clearly tries to tell you that the particle concentration is almost down by a factor of five. Now why this is important? It is important because at this particular location, if your characteristic sources are changing, obviously your characteristic properties are also changing. Uh, then what we basically realized is that this particular why this basically becomes as a bimodal distribution that obviously either you have the removal of one particular source or the addition of partic one particular source. But as the time progresses, obviously that you need more and more instrumentation and that's what I think I believe Vijay said that you really can't have like 25 crores of instrument to really put it in here and then try to understand everything. 
And that's probably is the reason that why do you really need to collaborate? I mean, have you had like more and more instrument probably would have been able to answer the questions that what was going on here. Then what we did is that Vijay talked about it. So this is the clean, uh, look at this particle number concentration and then this is the bimodal distribution. So we picked up the same instrument, we waited for one year and said that okay, now during the same time we go to Gadaki because we only have one instrument, right? No, we don't have two instruments and then we rely on the modeler, uh, we kind of ask them to tune their parameters in a such a way so that they tell us, oh don't worry, if you majored in uh, Gadaki in 2013 or 2014, your synoptic metrology was the same. So I think, okay, fine, very nice for me, right? So at least what the modelers they told me, based on that, I can then now compare my results uh, with Munar, with Gadaki, because according to the models, the synoptic meteorology was still the same. Fair enough. Then what we looked into, the same type of measurements here. Now look at the particle concentration here, like 4,000, right? It's gone an order of magnitude up. Now this size distribution is much broader. Like, you know, it's really very broad. The, your geometric mean diameter, meaning that where it peaks, has really shifted almost to 100 nanometer. We saw really small particles in, in Muna. Then it came to June, and this was really a surprise that you still have around 3,000 particles and then really even a broader distribution. As you go along, obviously the size distribution more or less remains the same, meaning that you really, once the season sets in, you do not really have the large differences or the variation as far as your size distribution is concerned. Now, we didn't really stop in there. I mean, I would tell you the implication and what we did out of it. Then we said that, okay, we were here, we moved here, now let's go further. So then we came to Chennai, for example. Now your particle number concentration is like two order of magnitude higher than what it was there. And then we also tried to do it again the same season. Of course, the synoptic meteorology remains the same, and then we kind of follow that. Now, look at this particular peak, right? You know, it's really very uh, interesting to know that where does this peak was coming from. Now, what it taught us, I mean, she of course went on to use this data into the cloud parcel model, and then it, she tried to look into the different cloud formation regimes. Those papers are published, you could look into that. But I'm not going into this, but what I really want to try to understand, if you might have noticed it, for example, if you look into all these three pictures here, particularly pay attention to this, then this, and then this, you see that majority of the wind coming at all these three locations is kind of passing over or the coming from the Arabian Sea. So more or less the origin is same. Right? But what you really notice is that the characteristic properties are totally different. So what it has an implication that if, you, if the environment is really clean, it could really have an implication for the regional climate like the monsoon and other things. If you have a semi-urban location like this, uh, I'm sorry, it's still coming in from somewhere on the Arabian Sea, but it probably had some implication, some local sources and then how they affect the regional climate. But then when it comes to the really polluted region, obviously it has an implication for the air pollution. So really the regional climate to the air pollution, this is how the aerosols, uh, they play an important role in understanding that. Uh, you could look into these papers that how she further went on to use this size distribution data for the cloud parcel modeling, so on and so forth. Uh, let's move on to the chemical properties and then we started in this business a little late, uh, maybe in 2016 or 17 we started it and then 2018 for the first time we did this campaign and then uh, Professor Pandit Rai also mentioned about it. Now, this is a very unique uh, opportunity in India. There is a paper by Zhang et al. where they measured the uh, ACSM or AMS at 30 different locations across the globe. Now if you look into that chemical composition, more or less it remains the same. Right? 50 to 60 percent organics and then around 20 to 30 sulfate and then you have ammonium and then chloride and then nitrate and so on and so forth. But what basically we found interesting was although we just have the measurements uh, from like 3 to 5, 7 and 10 locations, look out this variability. Within Delhi we went on to have like a chloride as high as like 20 percent, right, you know, nowhere it was observed. So I will not go into the details of this, but what it tells us is that the 
uh, not only the Indian climate system, but then the scenario about the Indian air pollution is really very different and very local to what basically happens here, right? So this is again that uh, gives you an opportunity to probably collaborate more. I would not go into the details like, but I just want to give uh, an interesting story behind this paper, like you know how sometimes a patience it helps you. So we did this measurement in Delhi in 2018 and we found that there was a very high chloride. And then our hypothesis was it comes from the plastic burning, right? And then there are some metal prickling industries in Delhi where this HCL is emitted and then you have a very high ammonium concentration anyhow being the fertile land and endogangatic plane. So obviously the uh, thermodynamic model which we use is clearly indicated us that uh, it is ammonium chloride. But uh, it was not sufficient for us. So we brought all the instrument back to Chennai after measurement in Delhi and then we said that we just do nothing. Just hold on. So then we waited until the January for the festival of Bhogi in Chennai and then we said that we now set up our instrument because we knew from the previous experiment, experience that the Bhogi is the festival in, in Tamil Nadu where you kind of really get rid of all the old stuff that's some sort of a waste burning. I would not say plastic but then the waste burning. So we set up the instrument in, in 1st of January. Uh, there was some problem with the instrument so we really start getting the data on 5th of January and then we said that we don't really look at the data. I mean our hypothesis is lying there so just keep quiet. Just make sure that your instrument is running correctly. Uh, so my PhD student ran it and then we stopped on uh, February 3rd. And then we say that now we look at the data. So what do you expect? 14th of January being the Bogi festival, it's special. And that was our Eureka moment because on 14th of January in Chennai, it was exactly like Delhi with almost 25% of chloride. Rest of the time, the Chennai was behaving as any other global site with almost 60 to 50 to 60% organic, followed by sulfate, so on and so forth. And then we went on to details, did this all thermodynamic modeling to find out like how this high chloride concentration comes from and what the implications are. So what it taught me is that sometimes you just do nothing. That's that's a good thing. At times it's good not to just not to do anything and then just wait, right? But at least we knew that what I wanted to do. Um, this is the example of a polluted location. Delhi was highly polluted. Now we came back to Chennai. Uh, what we saw that in Chennai again there is one particular day where you have this high uh, this thing. But then, when the measurements were done in some different time, we saw a very low concentration of the mass. Now what it basically tries to tell us is that if we try to look into the different fraction uh, at a different time. So this was the uh, study which was done by one of my students where she found the marine influx, very high marine influx. So what we found is that during the regular time again that the 47% organics, 33% sulfate, and then just a regular urban site. But when you have the uh, winds which are coming from the marine region, your organic fraction, mostly the marine organics or secondary organics, can go as high as like 62%. So what it tells is that at such a location, your chemical composition can very rapidly change and it has a very strong implication for the air pollution. Let's go to the clean environment. I mean, I can't really stop talking about Munar, right, you know, at any point of time. So this is at the Munar, uh, a student called Kavya, she just graduated with her MS degree and then I think I should have probably scared her away and then she wanted to go to the industry now. I thought that she would uh, want to do the PhD after such a wonderful results. And this, this is again the campaign which I should have laid, this is from that campaign only, right, which she laid uh, last year. Now what striking feature which comes in here, you would never see anywhere, is that look out this mass concentration during monsoon. Consistently it remains less than 5, this is the organic, but this is stacked figure, so this is total mass. Uh, this remains consistently less than 5 microgram per meter cube. Now as obviously you would have noticed it, we also noticed that there are certain events where you really have the high organic, right? And that's what something which will now tell us, I mean we still have to work on these papers anyhow. Now these are the events which will try to tell us that what's something which is interesting going on here. Thankfully, uh, Aishwarya came with some 50 different instruments for the campaign, so we have the size distribution. And then unfortunately, Christy could not operate. You did not operate. Where did she? She's sleeping. Ah, she's here. <laughs> so you could not operate. Moody was not operated during that time, right? 
Okay, so then after a few days, our SESM stopped working and we couldn't really do anything. But yes, this is something interesting and we are trying to read, look into this. She again went on to separate the uh, analysis based on obviously these kind of an events. But what we basically found that there was one event obvious, one event which was very again key that as high as like 56% of organics and then how these organics really come in like BBOA, OA and this was during lockdown, right? And it was interesting that during lockdown also we saw some BBOA which is probably some T, -T factories which are here and then we still had some HOA maybe in emergency services so on and so forth but these details we can really discuss at any point of time. But what really matters is look at this range, very persistently less than 5 microgram per liter scale. Very beautiful, you can't see that very well. Uh, Bioaerosols, of course, um, we started this um, business long back, this is in 2013, and again that girl who is sitting there, this was her inlet probably 9 years before, at the same place, 2014 or 15? 2014, right, you know, this is the inlet which she had, uh, whatever the, you go to your wa hand wash, there is the next room, this is where the UV APS was kept, and uh, these are the measurements, basically she, uh, this is a 2016 ACP paper, right, yeah, okay. Uh, how many months of measurement, like two months of, two months, again, not allowed to go home, right, you know, every time she called, I said, no, no, Ashwati, you hold on, like, you know, you're getting good data. It's okay, Munar is nice, right, you know, and then it was very frustrating, but still stayed here for uh, two months and did this fantastic measurements. So what you see is that, again, we go back to the size distribution, and then she kind of then uh, divided this into three periods, like, you know, one is dusty. Now what happens is that if your monsoon, if it sets late, you get a lot of dust, uh, the Saharan dust before the, uh, just at the onset of the monsoon, right, you know, once the monsoon sets in, it is washed out and it becomes clean. Now one would ask that, oh by the way, uh, there is this person sitting, Nishan, he has to really get, uh, he has to, I mean we almost torture him, right? You know, we said that this is useless because this instrument was really a troublesome instrument essentially and that was the last uh, baby which PSI supplied to us. So I remember that one day we said him that, boss, either you come to Munar tomorrow morning or we throw this instrument, something like that, right? And then he was always helpful every time we called him, he came and then solved our problem all the time. So thanks to Nishant also. So what you basically see here is the dust particles because the dust also gives the fluorescence. And this, based on that, then Ashwati tried to separate it into three different periods. I think she called one is high bio because her bioaerosol concentration was very high and then dusty and clean. Now look at this, that during the clean period, this is the uh, number concentration of the bioaerosols and this is the mass of the bioaerosol, right? You know, so it just kind of, you can convert it. Now what you see is here, is that during the high bio concentration, obviously, as I will show you Emil's results also, that these bioaerosol concentration doesn't really care whether it is a clean, whether it is a polluted, or whether it is an extremely polluted. And the bioaerosol concentration and their size distribution more or less remains the same. Now that's really puzzling because we talk about the health effect of the aerosol, right? You know, so what it implies is that for the normal aerosols, you have certain limit of 20 microgram per liter, 60, 80, 90, right? But for these bio aerosols, it doesn't really matter because when you inhale one pollen, if it is going to cause you an allergy, whether it is in a clean environment or whether it is in polluted or extremely polluted, you are anyway going to fall sick. So just pay attention to it. It always speaks between two to five, uh, uh, and then this number concentration really uh, around, uh, I would say that 0.5 particles, uh, or ten, okay, it's 10 to the power 6 meter per meter cube, that's the concentration. Now what she did is that she separated that obviously, uh, no, these are now the Emil's results I believe, yeah, these are Emil's results. Now just try to compare this again, this is in Chennai, so she also did few days of measurements in 2021 before that instrument eventually died, now it is in we have this Emil's Museum of Bioaerosol Studies, so it is sitting in there now because that instrument cannot be repaired. But then what what we imply from that is that again, depending upon the characteristics, properties of where the wind is coming and then how these uh, aerosols are moving, again it is, it is slightly a shift here. It is not between 2 to 5, it is slightly lower than 2 and this is where we have this debate. 
that uh, we believe that it is the fungal spores, but then Emil says that it is not fungal spores, but the bacteria, right? And then she doesn't say it just because she feels it. I believe she has a proof for it because she did the very complicated uh, next generation sequencing. Now, how do you do that? You have the biomass collected on a filter paper, DNA extraction, then using the DNA kit, extraction kit, that, that is how they do it. It's very expensive. Then the quantification of uh, it's, uh, this GDNA, like the genome of it, right? Genomic, this thing, using that. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to tell you that it is too complicated. <laughs> That's the reason I believe that uh, then she, she kind of takes some pictures and then goes somewhere and then some huge amount of data comes in. It's still going on, my God. <laughs> oh, it is there. Yeah. So after so much of a complication, I had to surrender and say that, okay, that's perfectly fine that uh, what you have is the bacteria and not the fungal spores. But yes, that is right simply because the fungal spores, they uh, pick in the size of 2 to 5 uh, micron, whereas the bacteria, less than 2 micron, I think I have to agree with her that it is, uh, it is probably the, uh, not fungal spore, but then the bacteria. And this is how we are now going to write that uh, paper. How much more time do I have? Three minutes. Aerosol modeling and limitation. Uh, I, I just found out this figure, which is a very nice um, figure from uh, uh, Lena Frey, uh, which the... Uh, you hello? have... I have... Um, so this is one figure which I found, like, you know, that aerosol modeling over India. And what I found interesting, I went to the... Uh, just before the talk, I went to the... Uh, Google and then I typed in aerosol modeling over India and after that I just went to the images instead of website I went to the images and what I found is our paper coming first right that's not true because it's not really the aerosol, aerosol modeling over India so what it really means is that even Google also doesn't really have a true knowledge as far as the <laughs> aerosol modeling over India is concerned and that's really very bad now of course it is more because of the complications which we have. Uh, everybody has talked about it, but what I'm saying is that the aerosol emissions and then the inventories or the wind-driven facts which you have, how it basically interacts, like, with that is very important. Now, I'll just wrap it in two minutes if the chair can allow me. Aerosol modeling or India, why I think I know very little is because sometimes you get students like Christy or Aishwarya, they come up with some properties of aerosols which you can't explain whether it is physical, chemical, or biological. And then I'll talk about this recently uh, recently uh, accepted paper of hers uh, in, in PJ Climate and Atmospheric Sciences. This was during the COVID lockdown, right? Uh, Vijay talked about it, and I'll not dwell upon it too much. Had COVID not been there, we would have not been able to understand this, right? Now, how do, uh, where do, where do, how do you delineate this implication of the power plant aerosols on the cloud formation? Unless you really shut down the other aerosols, right? I mean, the modelers can easily do that. That's not the problem. But now probably they can do it because we are giving them the clear implication and then the source and then characteristics, properties that how you basically delineate it. I'll not go into the details of that. But this is just to show you that this was uh, during the lockdown. This was during the business as usual. This is the Nidalee power plant, which is a huge power plant. And then she kind of tried to see the implication of this power plant how it depends on the cloud formation. But again, even if it is a complication, unless Munar is also complicated, my talk cannot be completed, right? And that credit goes to Christy that she made Munar again very complicated. So she did a very novel measurement. She used this QCM. So she collected the filters. She took it back then to Chennai. And then this cost distal microbalance is an instrument which is used by the medical fraternity. So what she did is that she transferred those particles on a cost sensor put them onto the QCM and then vary the relative humidity. Uh, what she looked into is that, of course, that sensor has a vibrating frequency. So as the aerosol, they uptake the water, their frequency will go down, right? And then she does all sort of magic with that. And what she concluded based on taking this derivative and all calculations for the size resolved measurement, as the change in the frequency goes down, more this number goes down, more the water particles are uptaking the smaller particles, right? And then what she uh, uh, looks into the uh, other aspect of it and does further calculation, and then even tries to calculate the deliquescence 
and then the phase change of the particle. Now please try to understand that the most complicated problem which we face is that how the particles, they interact with the water vapor in the subsaturated region is the biggest knowledge gap for us. Not in the super saturation, right? Now this phase change, now imagine that if you have a particle, if you know the RH history of that particle, that how it has really behaved, then it becomes easy for us to kind of model that how this particle is then going to behave as far as the CCN activation or the cloud formation is concerned. Now their phase change and phase transition. Is, so, uh, Christy, if I'm not wrong, this this indicates the phase change or the phase change. This this phase change. So this is the point at this relative humidity. Now, if you look into these smaller particles, even up to 90 percent, they still remained non-aqueous. Either it was a glassy or it was an amorphous structure. I don't know. But then for these bigger particles, right after 60 percent they became solid to aqueous. I mean, that transition has happened. Now, you imagine that these particles, if you have the data for these particles, that how they would behave in cloud, or how these would behave in cloud, I think it's not a rocket science to understand that these would probably be the better CCN, right? So, the, the average history of the particle is extremely important. And then she went on to calculate this Kappa growth factor, so on and so forth. And this is the biggest complication from the Munar I would personally take somebody for a dinner that if somebody can explain us that what this figure means. But don't ask it to Christy. So she has a relative humidity which is then scaled by the size of the particle and then she has tried to calculate the kappa for each one of them which is then plotted against the aerosol liquid water content, right? So, uh, that, and this is all for the subsaturated region, not even for the super saturated region, right? So that's the reason the aerosol are very complicated. And this is again for Muna. Well, I'll not get into this one, then I will then uh, skip this, but if you can allow me two minutes, I just want to play a video. Uh, Dr. Shweta, can I, can I play a video for two minutes? Okay. So we have this privilege of uh, collaborating with the Harvard University, uh, Max Planck Institute for Chemistry, Manchester University, uh, and then the Georgia Institute of Technology. We are also working to understand that how we can transform this knowledge to the society uh, by helping the policymaker where they can take our uh, science back knowledge and then the policy. My research focuses on understanding the role of ambient aerosol Together, we can and will make a difference. 